Good morning. Happy uh, into the uh, Charlie Day's festivities and Sombrero Fest and all that. Last week I said something, uh, and I think I confused some people. I said I retired from the jalapeno eating contest. I had several people ask me if I was retiring. I'm only 50 years old. I'm way too young to retire. I, was, I retired from the from the jalapeno eating contest. That's all that I retired from. All right. I also misspelled Amish last week, so I felt like a dummy. So it's A M I S H. Okay. So, so there we go. Yay. So now that I've cleaned up, yeah. now that I've cleaned up what was what was the mess of last week, we'll move on and make a mess of this week. Okay. Um. Welcome, welcome to River Church. Glad you're here. Um. We're in we're in our study of Genesis and. Uh, we're finding Jesus all over the book of Genesis, and I think you'll see that again today. I want to begin by telling you uh, about a, a period of my life in 2006. In 2006, Lydia and I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I must have been 37 years old. I'll show you a few pictures of us back then so you can believe that we were once young. Uh, can you go through some of those photos that are here? Um, so there we are with uh, with our little ones. Truett made Truett apparently made the honor roll. See that? Uh, that's Emma and uh, Nolan and uh, Alyssa's not there, but I think she's in the next photo. There, uh, there's uh, Alyssa and Emma in a little emu or what's that guy's called? Emo? No, let's see, Elmo. Elmo. <laughs> yeah. All right, and uh, keep going through the photos, and that's Nolan. Okay, keep going. There we are at the Albuquerque Zoo. All right, Lydia, is that what that is? Maybe there's one more photo. It's my favorite. No, that's not my favorite. That's a nice one. But here is Emma. Is Emma in here? Oh, she's in the nursery. Well, she'll miss this. But here's my favorite one right here. There's Emma. She, she, she would only whisper. Like for the first three years of her life, she only whispered. Believe it or not, and uh, there wasn't like a medical condition or anything. She just, she just uh, was very, very meek. And I would come home from lunch because I would walk because we lived downtown where the church and the church was downtown. I would walk home, and Lydia and Emma were the only ones home because the older ones were were in school, and uh, they would just be whispering to each other. And so I would have a very quiet lunch, and then I would go back to work. But So t- 2006, the fall of 2006 was a significant time in our lives as I, the, the husband, the dad, I, I began to have this deep, deep sense of really just a desire. I wasn't sure it was from the Lord, but a deep desire to move back to South Texas, to move back to Brownsville, to move back to the place where I was born and where I grew up. And the, the problem was, as I've already alluded to, I wasn't at all sure that, that, the, that God was in this, that, that this was the will of, will of God. But, but what had begun as a, a slight desire to, to move home and to raise my kids in South Texas had just begun to, 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 to grow into a real deep passion a passionate desire, and I don't know if you've ever felt this 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 before, but I had this sense of God, don't let me make a mistake. <laughs> God, don't let me go somewhere that 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 you are not leading me. You know that song we see we sing sometimes um, that that says, uh, "I won't move without you. I, I won't go somewhere unless you go there, Lord." That's very much how I felt. And so in the summer, I'm sorry, in the fall of 2006, I began earnestly praying. I remember Lydia um, kind of got tired of me talking about it, and she said, would you just pray about this? And, and that, for me, was a cue to, like, stop talking about it and start praying about it. So I probably continued talking about it, but I did start praying earnestly. I would get up um, each morning in the fall, and I would, uh, when it was still dark, in my robe, I would go out into the deck, and I would just pray, God, if you want us to move to South Texas, would you open the doors? Would you give me that deep sense of confidence? Would you show me if this is you? Oh, God, I don't want to move without you. Oh, God, I don't want to go there unless you're going with me. And um, and in that prayer, and, and through that process, and it 
was certainly an imperfect process, and certainly my own wants and desires were, were, were not always perfect and not always pure, but, but in that process, uh, uh, praying over something that, that uh, more than at that point I'd really prayed about anything in my life, like more, I prayed about that more and more consistently than really anything that I'd ever prayed about in my life. Through that, through that time, we ended up here, you know, and, and uh, we had another kid. We had, we had our, fa- our fifth child here. He was born in the same hospital that I was born in. That's Boyce. And we, we, uh, we planted River Church, and we, we've developed a deep web of friendships. And, and I suppose that Lydia and I will probably die here one day. And that was an all, all, all a result of that one fall, you know, maybe a couple of months, of earnestly praying. Now, now, I believe that, that, that some of you, or, or maybe many of you, in this room this morning, you are struggling through some, some decision, or maybe it's not even a decision, but you have some sense of wanting to know the will of the Lord in your life. And you're saying, you're saying much like I said, God, if you'll just show me, I'll do it. If you'll, if you'll go with me, I'll go there, but oh God, don't let me go without you. And so today what we're talking about is the twofold struggle to, to know God's will. And, and then the second part is, is to believe that it's good. Oh God, that I might know your will. And oh God, that I might have the faith to believe that it's actually good. We find that in the context of the story from Genesis chapter 24. Um, so let's jump right in. There is a lot of reading to be done today from from the book of, from uh, from chapter 24. I'm going to read much of it to you, and then I'm going to tell you a little of the story. Um, else we'll be here all day reading. So I'm going to read read much of it. Follow along on the screen, or follow along in your Bible or your phone, and then part of the story I will simply tell. All right, let's jump right in. Je- uh, Genesis chapter 24. Now, Abraham was old, and that's an understatement. Abraham was old, and, and uh, he was well advanced in years. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, this is probably the servant that would have inherited all of Abraham's belongings had Isaac not been born. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, his trusted confidant, who had charge of all that he had, he says to this this servant, put your hand under my thigh. Let's stop there for a second. In that custom, in that day, when two two people or two men were going to make a pact, they are going to have a solid agreement over something really, really, uh, really significant, then apparently one guy would put his hand under the, under the, we'll call it the thigh of the other, of the other man, and he'd say, like, like well, I'm serious here. And the other guy would be like, yeah, I can tell. He'd say, I'm serious here. And then they would, they would, they would make an agreement. And so put your, put your hand under my thigh, he says, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. Remember, they're living in this foreign land, this pagan land of Canaan. Don't take a wife for my, uh, from, for, for, my, for my son from the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But, but you go to my country, to my kindred, and take a wife for my son Isaac from, from there. Verse 5, the servant said to him, well, perhaps the woman uh, may not be willing to follow me to this land. Uh, must I then take your son back there, back to the land from which you came? And Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you. And you shall take a wife for my son from there. And then, as we all do, we realize, like, you know, I may not, though. I may not be hearing. 
hearing from the Lord. I mean, I, I, I could be missing it, missing it here. Maybe there's something I'm missing. He accounts for that. Verse 8, he says, But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. He's really serious about that, right? So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels, catch that, ten camels, and he departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts for, uh, from his master to, to, give to, the, to give to the lady, to give to the family. So it's like a ancient, ten ancient U-Hauls, okay? Ten ancient, uh, ten, ten camels, uh, dragon, all sorts of choice gifts. Think on that to the city of Nahor, and he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, um, the time when women go out to draw water. And he, he the servant, um, he said, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, interesting word choice there, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, Please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. He continues on with this prayer, the servant does. He says, Behold, I am standing here by the spring of water that the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall, say, who shall say back to me, Drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Okay, so you got that before we go on. He says, he says God, God of my, of my, uh, uh, of my master Abraham, uh, be good to Abraham. Be good. Good to him. Would you answer this prayer? I'm going to say to, to some lady, some young lady, um, I'm thirsty. Give me, give me, give me water to drink. And then she's going to say back to me, "Here you go, drink, and I'll also water your camels." Let her be the one. It's it's sort of sort of testing God. Would you would you do it that way, God, so that it's really clear? Maybe you've prayed that prayer, God. I know you've kind of made it clear, but would you just make it so clear that it's just undeniably clear? And then I will obey you. I don't think that sort of prayer dishonors God in the least bit. Sometimes it speaks to our lack of faith or just sort of the, the infancy, the, the, the newness of our faith. Maybe we're not real mature. And we're like, like, I mean, I, I pray this sometimes. God, just make it a little more clear. I think I hear you, but just make it a little more clear. That, 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 that's what's going on. Going on. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. Continuing on, the young woman was very attractive in appearance. Isaac will be glad for that. And she's a maiden whom no man had known. Um, and she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her. She apparently thinks she's the one. The servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me, he does this, this little test thing, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar uh, upon her hand and, and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, <coughs> She said, I will draw water for your camels also, until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water, and she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold 
shekels. Probably put one in her nose and a couple on her on her on her arms. I mean, seriously, I'm not I'm not joking. That sounds funny, but that's that is probably. And, and said, please, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? Us meaning the uh, him and his entourage. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. We're, we're going to stop there in our reading for now. Let me tell you the rest of the story. So what we have is we have um, we have the servant who is um, respectfully uh, praying to the God of his of his household, the God of his of his master Abraham, and he puts the Lord to a test in in a sense. Because he doesn't know. He doesn't know what God is leading. And, and God does exactly what he asks. God makes it, makes it very clear. This is Rebecca. Her name is Rebecca. She is the one. And, 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 and so uh, the way that she responds is, is worth noting. She, uh, she, she's, a, she's a kind uh, lady. She's a young lady. She is apparently a beautiful lady. She is apparently a lady that is that is very strong. She's not a wallflower. She's, uh, she's a hard worker. Why do I say that? Because she waters the ten camels. I looked this up. I looked it up this week. How, many, how much water can a camel drink in one setting? You know, at one time. And you know, it's much like a car. Uh, you can fill up, maybe with 25 gallons, you can fill your your car up with gas. A camel, believe it or not, can actually drink more than that. But let's just call it 25 gallons. And she 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 watered all these camels. How, how many camels are there? There are 10 camels. So think of it. Like 250 gallons of water. This is a spectacle. This is not a normal event. This isn't just something that could have happened by chance and, and maybe it was God and maybe it wasn't. And, and this gal must have been a strong gal. She, she, she dragged 250 gallons of water out of this well for these stinking camels that were, that were dragging all the, all the loot, all the good stuff. So then she says to, to Abraham, she says, come on, come to my house. My, my, my dad's there. My brother's there. My mom's there. There's plenty of room. There's plenty of straw. There's plenty of hay. There's plenty of food for your camels. I will feed you. We'll, we'll put you up for the night. Uh, come on over. Now, if you're like me, you have more of the parents' perspective, right? And you're like, you invited who to dinner, right? But she invites all these people and all these camels, and they all come over, and they're welcome. And uh, the servant tells the dad, the brother, who's going to now be the brother-in-law, the mom, tells the whole house, this is what happened. God sent me here. Abraham sent me here. This is over 400-mile journey. I've come to find a wife for Isaac. And crazy as it sounds, they're like, hey, that's the hand of, that's the, hand of the Lord. This couldn't have been circumstantial. It couldn't have been coincidental, rather. This has to be the word of the Lord. It's not up to us to say yes or no. God is in this. And then they want to they wanna, they wanna take some time, and they want to party, and they want to celebrate. And uh, the servant's rolling out all the goods. He's giving the mom gifts. He's giving the brother-in-law gifts. giving the dad gifts. He's giving Re- uh, Rebecca gifts. He's got gifts for everybody, ten camels worth of gifts. And then they want to stick around for a while. He's like, oh, i got to leave now. We need to go now. If, if you're in this, let, let's go now. Rebecca is called out. She says, Will you, are you willing, dear, to go? Tonight or tomorrow morning? Are you willing to go now? It's like, yeah, I'm willing to go now. Deep, deep faith this young girl had in the Lord. It was clear to her that God was in this. So she, along with a small entourage of ladies, uh, her helpers, her nurses, uh, they, they they pack them up on the on the uh, the camel and they head back to a Isaac's homeland. 400 miles away. With that, let's pick up in verse 62. It says, Now Isaac, remember, this is the, this is the guy that's given the wife. By the way, he's 40 years old. 40 years old. We'll come back to that later. But he's 40 years old. He doesn't have a wife. 
This isn't like a second or a third or more. No, this is, he doesn't have a wife, 40 years old. Now, Isaac had returned from Beer the High Roy and was uh, dwelling in the Negev, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. It must have been a practice of his to go and pray as the sun would go down. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. There were ten camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself, which was a ritual when you were going to see your fiancé. She covered herself. And, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. You wouldn't believe, Isaac, what, 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 what it took to find you a wife. Verse 67, Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The word of the Lord, for which I give thanks. So today's context, obviously, is finding a spouse. That's the context of the story. Isaac and Rebecca, both, they need a mate. And they're being brought together by the sovereign hand of God. But the principles that we're going to talk about today apply to all of us, to those of us who are seeking answers from God, in other areas in our lives. Um, some of you in this room, not to make people uncomfortable, but some of you in this room are looking for a spouse, but all of us are looking for answers. In, in small ways, you're looking for an answer from the Lord. In, in some pretty profound ways, probably everyone in this room, we're looking for answers. A few of us are looking for a husband and a wife, all of us looking for answers. So as I said, there's a struggle, this constant struggle in life. One, oh, that I might know the will of the Lord. And number two, oh, that I might have the confidence to believe that it's actually good for me. So the story gives us hope as we, as we strive. If you think on it, if you've heard me preach through the book of Genesis over the last several months, think on this. Abraham, who's, who may be dead at this point, Abraham is really matured. He used to be a guy who was who would try to wiggle his way out of problems. He would lie. Uh, he would he would he would shortcut uh, cut, cut corners. He would make his own path. He was he used to be the kind of guy that would just wiggle his way out of problems himself. But now something about uh, almost sacrificing his son. Remember that. Uh, now he's this, he's this mature uh, giant of a spiritual man, and now he's got, he's got faith in the Lord. The Lord will do this. The Lord, the Lord will deliver us. And, 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 and oh, that we, might, that we might see that sort of progression of faith in our lives. So here's what we're trying to determine. How do I know God's will, and how do I know it's good for me? Seven really brief ideas. You can write these down if you want. How do I know God's will, and how do I know it's good for me from today's story? Number one, I'm going to encourage you to put the pressure back on God. Put the pressure on the Lord. In, in trying to determine God's will, God's leading, maybe, maybe specifically um, in trying to find a spouse, if, if, if that's you today, the, Maybe you're putting too much pressure on yourself. Like, i got to get this done. i got to make it happen. And the clock's ticking, and I'm not getting any younger, or whatever your issue is, you know. Maybe it's like when I was moving to Brownsville. Maybe you're thinking of doing something new, and you're like, man, time is ticking, and i got to get this done, and i got to figure this out. And I would, I would say, put the pressure back on God. God, God can handle that. Remember, Abraham, he 
speaks these words of faith into the life of a servant, the servant says, well, well what, if, what if she doesn't want to come with me? You know, what if I, what if I think I've found the wife and then she doesn't want to, want to come back? And, and Abraham, what does he do? He puts the, he puts the, 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 the weight back on the Lord. He says, he says, he will send his angel before you. Rest in that. Rest in the fact that the pressure, the responsibility, the weight is on the Lord. Is there something for you to do? Yeah, we'll talk about that about in a minute. About that in a minute. But but first of all, put the pressure on the Lord. He can handle that. Exodus thirty-three. It's a different context, but it it speaks to that this this the fear that I spoke of uh, earlier of like God, don't let me go ahead of you. God, don't let me move without you. The Lord told Moses, different story, but very applicable, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. The Lord's putting the pressure on himself. He's like, it's going to be okay. I got it. I'm going to take care of it. God's telling Moses that. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us? Go on to the next. Or is that it? That's it. All right. So, the same idea here. Moses is saying, the pressure's on you, God. The pressure can't be on us. Because if we move without you, we're going to look bad, you're going to look bad, Put the pressure on the Lord. When you're looking for for God's will, when you're when you're when you're when you're striving for an answer, put the pressure on God. Number two, resolve to respond, not react. Now this this takes a little bit of uh, a little bit of explanation. Here's what I mean: in the aftermath of not immediately getting what you want from God, hearing from the Lord. What do we so often do? We often just hurriedly make up our own solution. Have you ever done that? Do you ever fall into that into that trap? Like, I haven't heard from the Lord yet. I haven't heard from the Lord uh, in time. i got to hurry the process along. I'm going to move it along. I'm going to react rather than just responding. Remember, remember what Abraham says to the servant. Look, if, if God doesn't act, if God doesn't move, if God doesn't provide the wife, you're free to go. You're off the hook. Don't worry about it. He doesn't, he doesn't come up with some panic-stricken plan B, and nor should we. Like, if you pray earnestly for something, and, and, and really you determine, like, God didn't come through, which I'm going to, I'm going to propose won't happen, but if you if you if you put the Lord to the test, you're like, well, He didn't come through. Guess what? Burden's not on you. You don't have to react. You don't have to fix it. Maybe a simple, maybe even kind of silly, but but actually pretty real example would be, you know, when you pray for your finances and like it doesn't happen in time. You got out of my hand. Doesn't happen in time. So you go get some silly payday loan. Or you, you go you go get some high interest loan and in panic mode and 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 you you react rather than responding there will be times in your life where you will, you 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 need money and you have a deadline for it and that deadline comes and goes and god doesn't at that moment provide you know what i'm suggesting you do just respond don't react in a panic-stricken mode. Trust that God's in this. There's, there's a different timetable here than what I thought. Number three, I will start with what I do know about God and His will. Here, here's what I mean by that. When you're trying to make a decision, when you're asking for God to lead, to direct, to unveil His will, if you've been a Christian for a while, or even just a, a little while, you've got you've got a body of material to fall back on. Like God's already been He's already worked in your life. There are things that He's already done. There are things that are already super clear. Like there are things that you like like you you know uh, you know some 
things already about the Lord. That's true of Abraham in this decision. Abraham started with what he did know, and he worked from there. So when you're trying to, to determine God's will in your life, start with what you already know. What God has already revealed. What you already know about the Lord's will. In, 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 in um, Abraham's life, uh, he, it seemed like he knew at least three things. We're not going to project these, but I'll tell you what they were. Uh, first of all, Abraham knew, number one, Isaac needs a wife. Not just because he's 40 years old and needs a wife, but, but Isaac needs a wife, and, and Abraham knew that uh, because God had already told him that, that from your offspring, uh, through Isaac, a great nation will be born. Uh, you will be the father, the patriarch, Abraham, of this numerous people. Uh, too numerous to count, a nation of people, and through that nation, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Uh, Jesus will, will, will be born out of that line, out of that lineage, and it's all going to happen through Isaac. God had already told Abraham that, so Abraham knows, well, number one, Isaac has to have a wife. So he's working with what he already does know. There's a second thing that Isaac knew. Isaac, I'm sorry, that Abraham knew. Abraham knew, number two, Isaac cannot marry a Canaanite woman. Why do I, why do I, why do I believe that, that he already knew that? Write this down. You can look it up later. Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. We won't go there. But, but in Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, God, God told uh, Abraham, listen Abraham, these people, the Canaanites, uh, they're under my judgment. And for several more generations, they will incur, experience my judgment. I'm going to hold them down. I'm going to hold them accountable for the wickedness, um, for the wickedness of the Canaanite people. And so I believe that that, 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 that goes into uh, Abraham saying, do not let him marry a Canaanite woman. Because he knows the Canaanites, they're going down. The Canaanites, they're going to be oppressed by God. God is judging them. He is going to continue to hold them down for, for generations. Uh, he's going to hold them accountable for their sins. And therefore, Isaac must thrive. Isaac um, cannot marry Canaanite woman for that. It wasn't a racial thing. It wasn't. It wasn't um, like don't only let him marry his own kind. It wasn't that at all. He knew that the wicked Canaanites were, were going to be held down, and he know he knew that Isaac must rise above that. So do not let him marry Canaanite woman. So so Abraham is starting with things that he already knows. And what I'm proposing is when you are attempting to make a decision, when you are attempting to hear from the Lord, it's not in a vacuum. You've already heard from the Lord in the past. And don't discount what you already do know. Don't act as though you've never heard from the Lord before. God has already told you things. He's already spoken in your life. Rest in that. Fall back on that. Number three. For number three. Um, Abraham knew that Isaac must not go back to his homeland. Now, I can't tell you how he knew that. I, 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 don't, I don't know. But it was very clear. Abraham says, whatever you do, don't take Isaac there. Go get him a wife. Bring her here. Don't take him there. How, I, how Abraham had determined that, I don't know. But, but the point is, Abraham started with what he did know in attempting to determine the will of the Lord. Number four, talking about how I know God's will and how I know that it's good for me. Number four, I will do the work necessary to find God's will. Here's what I mean by that. Many of us, in attempting to determine the will of the Lord, are pathetically lazy. Okay, can, we just, can we just own that? Or maybe you don't want to, but I'm going to own that for you. Because uh, I know, I know, I've, 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 I've shepherded, I have discipled, I have led a number of, number of Christian men, and I know how we say we want to hear from the Lord, we want to know the, the will of the Lord. We just don't. We just, we just have a 
hard time deciphering the will of the Lord, but then we're pathetically lazy in our attempts um, to determine what that is. Now, I already said, put the pressure on God. I already said that he's going to come through. I already said the work is the Lord's. So, so what am I, what am I, am I, am I back checking here? I'm not. Let me explain what I mean. Well, in this case, the servant in this story went on a 450-mile 400, journey to find this gal. 450-mile journey. Now, I, uh, in contrast to, to that, I am amazed at how often people tell me they're struggling with a decision. Or, or, they're, or they're struggling with a need. Or they're trying to determine God's will and they have spent little or no time praying about it. You guys turn in your connection cards and you and you, you tell me and you tell the four of us, the elders, we're a church that's led by four elders, you 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 tell us what's going on in your life and, and what your what your burdens are and, and that is a, a beautiful I love the fact that you share your needs with me and I love praying for you. Um, but sometimes I wonder if, in, in some cases, I have spent more time praying about some of your problems than you have spent praying about some of your problems. Are you praying for yourself? Are you praying earnestly for yourself? Do you go away like you go away uh, for a workout or like you go away uh, retire to another room for that special TV show that, and, and 60 minutes is no problem. problem uh, taking 60 minutes to watch your show is no problem at all. You know? Or 45 minutes at the gym is no problem at all. Do you have that sort of intensity to your times of prayer. I really am astounded at how many people just spend little or no time in prayer at all. So yesterday, um, well I should backtrack, uh, a whole year ago, there was something that I was praying about that was heavy, heavy on my heart. And I prayed about it much. I prayed about it often. I prayed about it regularly. Um, born out of that was just this sense, this new sense that I was praying in the Spirit, that the Holy, the Holy Spirit was moving supernaturally, even in my, in my private prayer times. And, and it, was a, it was a burden. It was something that I was praying about, but it was something that I was also worrying about. Not, that's not good, right? We're told to uh, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. And so, so a year ago, I was praying earnestly about something, and I was worrying much about it. And what I came to realize over the past year, as the Lord answered that prayer, that I should not have worried at all, because it was not a problem at all. In fact, it was a beautiful thing that God did. I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you what it was, but but it was it was it was a, it was it was a burden that I was carrying, and so uh, so it's come around again. Twelve months later, it's come around again. The same issue, um, a, a new issue, but the same same sort of issue. And and this year, I went yesterday, uh, got alone, I prayed for about forty five minutes on this one issue, and and I realized that I wasn't worried. Like, it's the same issue I was worried about last year, but I saw God move mightily in this matter. And so this year, I'm going to pray, but I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to worry about anything, but I'm going to pray about everything because I'm working. I'm working to know the will of the Father. There's work that is necessary. Probably your answer isn't going to just fall from the sky or just... Just, just show up in your brain with you putting no work into it. So if you're, you're, maybe you're looking, maybe you're looking for, like I really need a wife, Abraham, or Isaac, 40 years old, really, you need, well, she's not, she's 
she not hanging out in her cubicle at work? Uh, she has to be sought out. She has to be found. It's an active process, not a passive process. So, so sometimes there's more than just prayer to be done. Sometimes all that you need to do is pray. But there's work to be done. In verse 63, I'm not going to go there again, but in, in, I pointed out when I read it. In verse 63, it says that Isaac was a man of prayer. Remember that he would, in the evenings, he would go and he would meditate, which means that he would go and he would, he would pray. He was meditating in the evening. And I wonder, I wonder if that's there to let us know that he was praying for a spouse. He was, he was waiting on the Lord for a wife. He's praying to the Lord that you might give me a wife. And, 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 and I'm 40 years old and I, I need a wife. And then he's praying that one evening and then he looks up and here comes a parade with his wife. There's work to be done to get ready for God to move in your life. Hear those words. Let me say them again. There is work to be done to get ready to hear from the Lord, to see God show up in your life. Like maybe your work is just preparing the ground, just just preparing uh, your own life so that when God finally shows up, you're ready. If you're not ready for what God wants to do in your life, you think he's just going to do it anyway? No, because he's a God of order. Using this context of, of marriage, Isaac had to be ready. Because marriage is for men. Marriage is not for boys. And you got to get ready. This is just one context. For those of you that are praying for this, you got to get ready to get married. I mean, maybe, maybe some of you in this room, maybe, maybe you're a grown man who is married, but you never really got ready to be married, and so now you're, you're not really grown up in a sense, and your, your wife feels like she's married to a boy, and it's time to grow up. And finding God's will involves preparing our own lives so that when God shows up, we're ready for it. We're ready for what he's going to do. He's not going to do something that we're not ready for him to do. Number five. I won't fear failure or rejection. For some of you, fear is just crippling you. You, you, you won't move left. You won't move right. You won't move at all. There's this fear of rejection, this fear of failure. God is not in that. God is not in your fear. God, God, God hates fear. It's an affront to him. There are parables throughout the Bible. There are stories throughout the Old and New Testament of how God is so offended by fear because it's like saying, God, you don't got this. Like, like I want to... I wanna, I want to have faith in you. I want to believe you got it, but I don't think you, you really don't got this. You don't know what you're doing, God. In Abraham's life, he's like, don't, don't fear, servant. It'll happen, or it won't happen, but God's in the middle of it. Let's, let's trust in the Lord. Number six, I will be active in my waiting. This is a little bit different than, than, than number four. Um, active in my waiting means there's more to your life than just your waiting. Some of you are crippled by your waiting. So all you can do is think about your waiting and you are not living productive lives because you're just waiting on the Lord to do this one thing. I've experienced that in my life where I, I couldn't or I wouldn't do anything else with my life because I was simply waiting. In this story, Isaac, yeah, he's waiting, but he's, he's actively pursuing other things. He's taking care of his flock. He's, he's going on trips. He's making money. He's pursuing other things. He's not just letting that one matter. I don't have a wife, so I'm just going to die. I'm just going to lay here on the ground until I have a wife. He is actively living his life. They, <clears throat> Rebecca, same thing. 
same thing that she's a camel watering, muscle laden, laden like worker of a lady. She's taking care of stuff. She's taking care of her house. Um, as 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 the daughter, she's 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 serving her family. She's good. She's good with her hands. She's busy about her work. I don't know. She's lifting weights at night so she can carry the water during the day. She's she's active. She's not passive. She's not a wallflower just waiting for somebody to rescue her and sweep her off her feet. And she's pursuing life. You, 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 me, we should be pursuing the Lord more than we're pursuing any other dream or spouse or, or, or uh, anything that we really want. We should be pursuing the Lord while we're waiting on whatever we're waiting on. Number seven. That's the last one. Number seven. I will... Expect deep comfort in whatever the Lord brings. This story has a beautiful, beautiful ending, right? Isaac welcomes Rebecca right there at the foot of the tent. He marries her, and so she becomes his wife. He takes her into the tent, and he finds deep comfort after the death. Of his, of his mama, finds deep comfort in the relationship in the arms of Rebecca. So God brings him deep comfort. But what I want us to believe, what I want us to hold as true, is that God will always bring you deep comfort. Even when he doesn't answer your prayers the way that you expect or hope. God won't always bring you the, the, the person that you think he's going to bring. Uh, God won't always bring you the conclusion that you have already written into the script. But what you can take to the bank is that God will always provide deep comfort. In finding the person that you are looking for, in, in, in not finding the person that you're looking for, in, in chasing your dreams, uh, in, in determining one day that, that that dream was not from the Lord. Nonetheless, God will bring comfort. Some of us have, have warped expectations in life. The satisfaction in life is elusive. Like you can get all the stuff you hope to get and line it all up there um, uh, in your living room and you're like, but I'm still not satisfied. Satisfaction in life is elusive until we are in, li in alignment with, with God's vision and, and, and God's values and God's plan for your life. The Apostle Paul calls it renewing our minds so that our minds are changed. The way we think, our perspective is changed. So no longer, no longer are we like, i got to have this stuff and then I'll be satisfied. Whoops, I got that stuff, but I'm still not satisfied. Paul says that when our minds are renewed, we have a new perspective. We see, we see things through this lens that God sees things. And his vision and his values are our vision and, and our values. And now, what do we receive? Deep comfort in whatever the Lord brings. Isaac took Rebecca and loved her and was comforted. How might that script be written into our lives? I, I took what the Lord gave and I, I embraced it and I was comforted. May those words roll from our lips. So let me ask you a couple of questions and then we're going we're gonna to pray and come to the table of communion. Really two simple questions today. Number one, what 
is it right now that you're waiting on? That takes no effort at all for you to answer. Most of us, we immediately know what we're waiting on. What, what are you waiting on? And, and, and question number two is, have you, have you been... Have you been praying about it? I once told, I once told a, a pastor by the name of Sam Storms, I said, I told him I was praying about something, and, and he's like, I said, I've been praying earnestly. That's what I said. He said, have you really, Randy? I said, yeah, I've been praying earnestly. He said, have you really, Randy? I said, yeah, you know, you're right, Sam. I have not been praying earnestly. I, I need to, but I haven't. It's like a confessional right there uh, where I realized, yeah, he's calling my bluff. Like, like I say I want this, but... But I haven't really been praying earnestly about this. So, so that's my second question. Like, what you say you're really after, you're really hoping for, have you been praying earnestly? Without ceasing, all the time. And then my third question, the last question is, what, what are you going to do in the meantime? What, how are you going to be active about the work of the Lord in the meantime? 